Okay, people, you know from our previous movie that images are blurred when you use long shutter speeds or opening times for moving subjects. So it is quite logical to use the opposite, which are short or fast shutter speeds, if you want to freeze motion. What shutter speed you actually need depends on three factors. Let's look at them one by one. First, the speed at which your subject is moving. Let's compare two scenarios. We have a sprinter on the finish lane and a family taking a Sunday afternoon walk. Now imagine you press the shutter and the chosen shutter speed is too long. While the shutter is open, the family will move a certain distance and create some blur. But because the sprinter is 10 times faster, he will move 10 times further and create even more blur. Now let's adjust the shutter speed so that it is just enough to freeze the motion of the family. The sprinter will still be blurred because he is much faster. So to freeze the motion of the sprinter, we need to use an even faster shutter speed. So far so good. The second factor that determines how fast the shutter speed has to be in order to freeze motion is the size of the moving subject in your frame. And when I'm talking about a frame, I mean our picture. Or in other words, the image on our sensor. So let's get back to our sprinter and look at the image right on the sensor of our camera. What if we zoom in on the sprinter? We would do that by using a telephoto lens or by moving closer. Doing that, we will not only magnify the athlete, but also the motion blur. So a subject that is moving at the same speed, but is bigger in our frame, needs a faster shutter speed. If that wasn't clear enough, here's another example. This bee on a flower in a macro image moves much slower than our sprinter. In fact, it moves just around one millimeter while the shutter is open. Yet it can create the same amount of blur because in the image on our sensor, it moves the same distance like the sprinter. And finally, here is a real life comparison. The next two images use the same shutter speed. In the first one, the airplane moves very little in our frame because it was very far away. You can't see any blur. In our second example, it was flying right above our heads, fills the frame and moves quite a bit in the image on our sensor. In fact, the airplane high up in the sky sure was way faster than the one close to landing. Still, it has no blur because it is so much smaller in our frame. As a general rule, if a subject is twice as big in your frame, you need double the shutter speed, in other words, half the opening time, to freeze it. The third factor you have to keep in mind when choosing your shutter speed is whether you follow your subject with your camera or you rather keep your camera still and wait for the subject to pass by. If you wonder what a difference that makes, we have another example. In this shot from a tripod, the landing airplane was too fast for the used shutter speed and as a result you can see a blurred airplane. But what if we move the camera with the airplane? We transfer the blur to the background and the result is a crisp airplane. This is not only a popular method to create the feeling of motion in an image, panning to follow your subject with your camera severely reduces the needed shutter speed to freeze your subject. But in fact, that is something you usually do automatically, because you follow a moving subject with your camera rather than wait for the subject to pass by. To sum things up, there are three questions you have to ask yourself when choosing your shutter speed. Does the subject move fast? How big is the subject in your frame? And are you going to follow the subject with your camera or will you keep the camera still? In the next video, I'm going to give you a ballpark in which shutter speed you need for popular scenarios.